klishta and a klishta are two aspects of meditation that are absolutely fundamental to yoga meditation and these are covered in chapter 1 of the yoga sutras these are the sutras 5 to 11 we did that in the last session also in the last session we covered sutras 12 to 16 the concepts of abhyasa and vairagya practice and non attachment in this session we continue with sutras 19 to 22 from chapter 1 some may easily attain a higher state of consciousness due to effort in previous lifetimes. These are advanced students. The others must have reasoned faith, put in energy into repeated practice and attain increasingly higher levels of concentration until they finally attain the higher knowledge that is our true nature which is pure consciousness. There are some fortunate privileged ones who have put in effort in a previous lifetime. Therefore, in this lifetime, it seems that these higher states come very easily and very naturally to them. One example that comes to mind is that of Raman Maharishi. He was a boy of 16 when he had a very deep, life-changing experience, a very profound, spiritual, spontaneous spiritual experience that completely changed him to the extent that he left home and started living the life of a recluse, ascetic and isolated himself completely and stayed in deep meditation. These higher levels of consciousness came relatively easily to him. He experienced something spontaneously and he was able to return to these states repeatedly and continue his practice over a period of time until he was firmly established even though he did not have guidance. He was able to do that on his own. So these are few rare privileged ones. All others must have faith. Faith is not blind faith, it is reasoned faith. That means whatever you believe in, it should be based on, on reality, not just a fictitious idea. You need to then put energy into repeated practice. It does not come just so easily, spontaneously and naturally. Requires repeated practice until that higher state of consciousness is attained. There are three kinds of students. So there are those who have a very mild degree of intensity and enthusiasm. Then there are the medium ones. They, they have a slightly greater intensity of desire. And then finally is those who have a very high degree of intensity. So I would say that those who are wanting to do this really full time, who are willing to make sacrifices, these are those who have a very high degree. 
Most people, on the other hand, have a very mild intensity or interest in these matters. There is an interest, but it is not really very deep. So, you can contemplate on this idea, these three, and ask yourself, which of these three categories do you fall into? If you say, I want to do this full time, I really want to know myself, I want to attain that state of yoga and know my true nature and nothing else interests me, then you are of the third category. You have a very high degree of intensity. If you have a very distracted person, you cannot concentrate for very long on anything, then chances are that you are in the first category, having a mild intensity. You might ask, of what use is this? Why should I know this? It is useful to know in which category you fall into, especially a teacher needs to know his students because the teacher then gives practices accordingly. It's also very useful for a student to know his own intensity so he understands what he really wants from his life. Those with the highest degree of intensity and enthusiasm attain higher levels of consciousness quickly. Once again, I come back to the example of Raman Maharishi. He meditated for many years and he attained and was established in these higher levels of consciousness and he was able to do that in those few years even without guidance which might bring us to the question if it took him some years what chances do we have it all depends on the degree of intensity this is really the absolute core. If there is no deep desire in you which drives you, it is unlikely that you will attain any high state of consciousness or you may not be able to maintain it, sustain it. You know this from any goal you have in life. If you are studying or you want to get a job, you want to have a career, in any area of life to achieve anything, we must have an interest. We must have a passion to achieve something. To be really successful, you need to be passionate about it. And this applies here as well. Just as students have been put into three categories, so also the system of techniques and the philosophy practiced also have been studied. They also have three categories. So, the system of techniques and philosophy are also slow, medium and fast. Consider this idea that you may be a student of high degree intensity, very, very passionate, but the method you're using is slow. Or... Consider a student who is very mild in intensity, not having that much of an intensity, but 
He has a system of techniques and philosophy that is very fast. You can imagine that they both, both these scenarios are very similar. So it's very important to have a system of technique, philosophy that is fast if you want to progress. What is slow philosophy and technique? This system is based primarily on rituals. This would be a system of techniques that is slow. The philosophy related to rituals is that of belief, blind belief. The person does not reason, does not introspect. So such a student who is generally of a mild degree tends to invariably find a system that is also slow. If such a student is graced, he may find a system of techniques and philosophy that is fast. Then he would have a guide or a teacher who helps him to interpret the philosophies and presents techniques that are guaranteed to work. I have to laugh a little bit about that because a lot of people are practicing rituals but they know for sure that sometimes when they go and ask for something very often they don't get it but they still keep doing it even though there is no guarantee and they know there is no guarantee. But in the system of yogic meditation when the meditation is done in the right manner, in the prescribed manner, with good, proper guidance, you have a guaranteed result. You can free yourself from the bondage of karma. So this... These verses explain to us the three kinds of students and the three kinds of methods that are available to the students. So even the most enthusiastic of students with the highest intensity will find you will find a difference if such a student is in a fast method or is using a medium method. Any questions or comments regarding this on the subject of three kinds of students or the three methods? Another system that is very slow is that which is based on intellectual study. Just as I mentioned rituals is a slow system, so is intellectual study. There are enough schools of yoga where people are learning to read texts especially the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and they are so intellectual that they do not understand them. Sometimes they merely memorize the sutras, and obviously they are not able to progress 
that's a very slow method so those systems based on intellectual study or rituals are considered to be slow within the yogic meditation of course there are systems which are external and there are those that are internal the the internal are the speediest the fastest they cut through the bondage of karma by burning the samskaras within okay if there are no questions in that case we continue to sutras 30 31 and 32 these verses are about practice and the solution the obstacle to practice and the solution on the path of meditation a student will encounter nine obstacles that disturb and distract the mind and these are sickness because the mind is the body is not in its natural state dullness of the mind doubt carelessness heaviness of the body and mind laziness sloth attraction to worldly pleasures inability to distinguish between right and wrong not being able to attain glimpses of a higher state of consciousness and not being able to establish oneself in the higher states of consciousness instability so i'm sure that as i was reading these nine obstacles some of you may have sort of thought about a couple of them identified perhaps one or two of these as an obstacle that is disturbing and distracting you your mind personally those who have a lot of physical sickness disease naturally have trouble because we are talking about meditation here and it's not possible for a person who is sick to meditate such a person or this body a sick body is not at ease it's diseased needs to be in rest it needs rest first and needs to recover this is also one of the reasons why we say that that yoga is not really intended to cure people of disease we see this now very often everywhere therapeutic benefits of yoga and it's true that asanas do have therapeutic benefits but these are very limited the real benefits come through meditation when the root cause is removed but when we talk about pathology the body is not in its natural state we first need to work at a physical level this is why ayurveda and yoga were considered sister sciences first take care of your diet physical health your lifestyle your routine all these aspects such a person who is relatively speaking healthy is suitable for yoga those who are physically very sick diseased cannot really meditate it's very difficult dullness of the mind it's a state of tamas it's very difficult for such a mind to meditate 
And so even if there's an effort, such a person always falls back into the nature of tamas, falls back into that heaviness, that dullness. It's very difficult to keep that effort up. What if you have doubts? You ask yourself, you're sitting there doing some meditation and you ask yourself, why am I wasting my time? Is this really going to help me? Look, everybody else is having fun. Why am I sitting here wasting my time? So these doubts, if they continuously nag you, it's very clear that you're not going to be very successful in meditation. Carelessness is somebody who is not really paying attention. No, he does things half-heartedly. This can be a big obstacle. Similarly, laziness, sloth. This is a person who knows this is good for me. I should do it. But still is too lazy. There's a lot of sloth. This is another aspect of tamas. Attraction to worldly pleasures. This is one of the biggest distractions. We are so used to the mind going outwards. There are so many activities happening and we are so out of touch with nature that our minds cannot calm down. We are continuously moving outwards. We have forgotten how to go inwards. And this is a big obstacle for most people. Number seven is inability to distinguish between right and wrong. This is somebody who does not have a very sharp buddhi. The buddhi is not able to distinguish between the two. This is a really fundamental problem. If this is an issue, this can be a very big obstacle. Another is not being able to glimpse a higher state of consciousness. If you are practicing some sort of meditation, but if you have not had any glimpse of a higher state of meditation, after a while, you begin to doubt yourself. You begin to lose interest. And this pulls you back. So it is important to have a glimpse, even if it is very, very brief. It is very useful and very important to have a glimpse of a higher state of consciousness. The shortest and the briefest of glimpses is going to change your life and really make you very firm in your practice. When you have a glimpse, doubts are banished from your mind. You will not have any doubts again. So that is... That's a great obstacle if you have not had any kind of glimpse of a higher state of consciousness. The ninth is having had a glimpse, you are now not able to establish yourself in a higher state of consciousness. So there's a great deal of instability. There may be some glimpses, it's coming, it's coming and going and coming and going. And you get frustrated you get dejected. This is what happens when you have obstacles. You have mental and physical suffering, you get frustrated, you get restless, body, mind, breath, everything becomes restless. So what is the solution? The Yoga Sutras offers a solution. It says, 
Continue with one-pointedness and enthusiasm and train your mind to focus on one object just like a river that flows over rocks that are in its path a student should continue to practice. So it says simply do not give up just continue. This is not an easy solution for most people it's very hard, but we need to continue. While this is a general solution for all of these, at a very practical level, I would say that one can look for some simple solutions which would make our life and practice easier. Let us take an example. If you are feeling a lot of dullness, heaviness, sloth, it is a good idea to start the day with some brisk walking some activity will help you rather than just sitting in meditation or just trying to force your mind into paying attention it is better to go for a brisk walk even jogging if, if that's what you like and then you will find that after some activity it is easier to pay attention. For those who have a great deal of attraction to worldly pleasures, what kind of solution can you imagine? What would you do? What would you recommend? No suggestions? Well, I would offer a suggestion and that is when the mind always goes outwards, we need to calm it down. We need to protect the mind from extreme amount of impressions. These days, people use a lot of mobiles and watch a lot of television. These devices they they disturb the mind they don't help the mind calm down they disturb the mind especially television there's a certain light this blue light of the television this keeps the mind very active so and these fast moving objects you know uh, pictures images on these screens this also disturbs the mind so one way would be to cut down the usage of these objects. Another way which is perhaps simpler is to read a few spiritual inspirational books in the evening. This helps calm down the mind. It inspires you. And if you read in the evening, especially before you go to bed, this works at the unconscious level in the night. And it really does help transform the personality. There are some wonderful, very inspiring books that you can read. One is Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yoganand. Another is Living with the Himalayan Masters by Swami Rama. Some of you might enjoy reading the Gospel of Ramakrishna. It's a very big uh, book, thousand pages and 
if one reads a couple of pages in the night before bedtime, that's very, uh, very soothing. Another interesting book is A Search in Secret India by Paul Branton. Such reading helps to still the senses, convinces the senses that we should not run after worldly pleasures. You can do such inspirational readings in the evening or if you have time in the morning before you start your day. This is not a new suggestion or a new idea. This has been an old tradition in India that one, used, one did uh, reading, one read these texts repeatedly again and again. The same thing again and again. Because it's not about reading more, learning more. It's about letting those ideas go deeper into your mind and to transform your mind. So there are other little simple solutions that are possible. Does anybody have an obstacle that he or she would like to share with us? If you had, might help you find a solution to it. There's a question, how about someone who is involved in many social projects? Is it also considered going outward? Well, if your social projects are in the external world, which of course they are, then that is considered going outward. Yes, that is outward moving Mind. Mind has to go out then. Related to these social projects are many, many activities. You meet many, many people, you have many activities, you become very busy depending on the amount of social projects you have. I'm assuming that not all the social projects are charitable or have a higher purpose, that many of them are social in the sense of meeting and wanting to uh, socialize. All these are part, are, are, are the joys of life. We want to enjoy our life. We want to enjoy being in the company of people. We don't have to isolate ourselves. But we need to find the right balance. And that depends entirely on whether you are a student of mild degree of intensity, medium degree or high degree. So for Raman Maharishi, he was not interested in social projects. He left everything and he went at a very, very tender age of 16 and spent many months in the dark cellar of a Shiva temple, a Shiva temple in Arunachala, uh, in Tiruvannamalai, until he was harassed by some boys who were throwing stones at him. And he moved to the mountain of Arunachala, where he then stayed in a little cave. That cave was so small, you could barely, you could not even stand in it. It's so small. And so for him, Everything was, dis was disturbing him at that point of time. That was his intensity. So to answer the question, social projects definitely are outward and can create an obstacle to you. 
but to what extent you want to change that depends on your intensity. If you say, I have a mild intensity, but I want to shift my intensity and make it medium. I, I want to have this de desire and I want this desire to grow. That's what we should all do. It's a very important part of practice that the desire in us, this intensity in us grows. Then I would say, yes, you should cut down your social projects. You don't have to stop them entirely, but you can cut them down. And if the social projects are have a worthy, uh, you know, noble purpose, then yes, it's a very good idea. But if they are only socializing, then you should keep in mind the company you keep, whom you socialize with. This too can be a solution. So you continue to socialize, but be very particular about whom you socialize with. That's called satsang. Satsang is not only the company of the teacher, but satsang is also the company you keep. I often use the example and I say, if you keep the company of thieves, sooner or later, the police is going to come knocking at your door. You may not have stolen anything, but you have kept the company of thieves. So the police is going to come and knock at your door. They're going to catch you and they may even put you in into prison because that is karma by association. So this is another simple solution that you learn to protect yourself. You are like a sapling, a little plant which has been planted and we don't want to destroy this sapling. It has to grow. So we don't want the goats to come and eat the leaves. We don't want the sheep to come and eat the leaves or some other animals to tr trod on it and trample it. So we put a fence around it. And when it is stronger, then it is really very firm. The roots are very firm. The trunk is very strong. It cannot be just knocked down by, by some passing animal. Then the fence can be removed. So also, when you are a little bit more established in your practice, you can go out into the world. Then it will not disturb you. This is exactly what Raman Maharishi also did. Once he had attained and was established, he came out of his cave and a, a big gathering of people came around there where he was staying. Ashrams were created, organizations were created. He didn't object to that. He didn't say much, but he did not isolate himself again. And obviously this social gathering or this satsang around him did not disturb him. So he was obviously very firm in his <clears throat> this higher state of consciousness. If that's where we want to go, then it's very useful initially to protect oneself a little bit. Until you are firm and established in a higher state of consciousness. And so the Yoga Sutras say, Keep doing your practice in a one-pointed manner and train your mind. Keep doing that. Ultimately, all these obstacles will subside. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments regarding the obstacles in practice and their solution.
Okay, in that case, I will continue to verses 33 to 39, chapter 1 of the Yoga Sutras. These verses are about stabilizing and clearing the mind. There are two aspects of practice or sadhana. We must learn to deal with both the internal world as well as the external world. Therefore, it is important to observe how we relate to the external world. It may become necessary to unlearn unhealthy thinking and behavioral patterns. In the earlier block on obstacles, I mentioned that attraction to pleasures or attractions, the mind going outward, is one of the obstacles. So here, again, this aspect is taken up and gone into further detail. How should we behave or what should we do or not do so that the external world does not become a problem, so that it does not become an obstacle? And it says, we need to observe our relationships carefully. If we observe them, we will notice that the, all our relationships with people fall into four broad categories. You will see people who are either happy, they are unhappy and miserable. Three, they are virtuous and good, or we perceive them to be virtuous and good. Or there are those whom we perceive to be wicked, selfish and bearing us in Ill, Ill intentions. So when people are happy, that's wonderful. What do we do? We continue to observe these relationships so we find responses that do not create further disturbance in our mind. So with such people, you cultivate friendliness. What do you do with those who are unhappy and suffering? For such people, you should cultivate compassion. What do you do about those who are virtuous and good? Cultivate goodwill and encourage those whom you perceive as virtuous and good. And here, the last one, that's the most difficult one. What do we do with those people who are wicked, selfish and bearing us ill intentions? It says, be indifferent. It's difficult if somebody tries to harm you. It's difficult to be indifferent or neutral. But it would be a strategy to ignore such people as far as possible. Now I use the word strategy and I'm sure that many of you are thinking about this as an instruction on what we should and should not do. So you think, hmm, this is a good strategy on how to behave with everybody. If somebody was really wicked and selfish, would you really be able to be indifferent or neutral? What about those who are happy? Are you able to, to feel joy in their joy? Or do you feel jealous? Are you able to feel compassion for somebody who is unhappy? Or do you sometimes actually feel a little bit happy when somebody you don't like is suffering? So you see... We have these emotions in us and while this may come across as a set of instructions on what you should do, it is in fact not. These are guidelines. It's important to be aware of your own 
emotions as well. But this is how one could manage the external environment. These are guidelines. It doesn't mean that you can always do it. So when you find that there's somebody who's happy, but you are not feeling happy about that, you feel jealous. How do you deal with that jealousy? Or you feel somebody is suffering and you're feeling happy. How, how do you feel about that? How can you work with this very nasty side? You know, this is known as schadenfreude. It means gloating over the suffering of others or feeling happy about it. So such emotions, we know it's not right. So how do we deal with this? Five methods are suggested to stabilize the mind, to clear the mind. I just had one question. Yes. On, on the um, four broad categories you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, it says one and two is um, people are happy or unhappy. Mm -hmm. But then three and four mm -hmm. makes a distinction. It says those whom we perceive as virtuous and whom we perceive as wicked. Mm. But it's interesting, it's not mentioned in one and two. Uh, they are either that we perceive them as happy or we perceive them as uh, unhappy. Is there a reason why there is this distinction? Well, generally, we, we see very clearly those who are happy and unhappy. Uh, somebody is really happy, uh, you will see that. And if somebody is unhappy, that's also very clear. I mean, when somebody is suffering. But virtue and ill intentions, these are generally hidden, especially ill intentions. If I have ill intentions, I'm not announcing them. And I may pretend or act like I have all, you know, have good intentions and I'm thinking about everybody's best, you know, have everybody's best interest in mind. Obviously, I would not reveal my true intentions. So, there is an element of perception involved in that. It may well be possible that somebody who has your best interest in mind, you still perceive that person as selfish and wicked because your mind is not purified because you are seeing the world in an upside down way this happens frequently with teachers when a teacher tries to discipline a student or tries to tell a student very honestly certain things need to be changed some students get very angry and they feel oh this teacher is not good. He's telling me these things and they get very angry and they leave. They leave the teacher. If the teacher's job is only to please the student and flatter the student, then he is not necessarily virtuous and good. He could be, in fact, then be selfish, right? He only wants more and more students. He wants to collect a, you know, a following. So there's a lot of perception involved there because our minds are cloudy. You remember we talked about right cognition and incorrect cognition. So we could have an incorrect cognition and not recognize a person with good intentions as being good. We could very well think that he is selfish and bearing ill intention. So in this there's a great element of how we see the world. With happiness and suffering, it's a little bit more obvious. It's a little bit more clear. Uh -huh. yeah. Does that make sense? Or do you still have, are you yeah. unconvinced? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And the, the other clarification I wanted to um, just ask for is um, this next paragraph. Um, be indifferent or neutral towards those you perceive as wicked. Yeah. 
sometimes I think this is really a, a big open door of misunderstanding that the yogis are supposed to be all nice and sweet and you know they they are not involved but I guess this is not the case right mm. so um, can you elaborate on this a little bit more how this observation here helps us to to be really in the world because there are some nasty people and sometimes one has to be firm with people and one has to be also uh, go out and do stuff um, yes so sometimes it can be misunderstood really here yes yes i agree entirely it can be misunderstood and that's why i said be indifferent or neutral as far as that is possible if somebody comes to harm you physically You can't be indifferent or neutral. You could try to run away, but in, if you cannot, obviously you have to defend yourself. Somebody may try to harm your family, your loved ones. Then obviously you have to, to fight. You know, it's, it's not meant to be a kind of escapism or a fatalistic approach or a cowardly approach. It is meant to be understood mostly in smaller things in life. If somebody comes and, you know, a simple example, you are traveling in a train and somebody pushes you aside and just sits down, you know, and you don't have a place to sit anymore. What do you do? Do you start shouting at the person and say, hey, this was my seat? It's a minor thing. You just be indifferent, be neutral. Let it go, because otherwise you complicate your external life, your external world. You get into a scrap with such a person, you get angry, maybe you start fighting. You know, one thing leads to another and things can get complicated. So, mostly this is referring to slightly smaller, you know, things. And it's not necessarily referring to really evil things. Like if you see somebody beating up a child, you know, would you just ignore, be indifferent, neutral? I don't think that would be the right, call, right action in that situation. Right? So this is with reference to our daily, normal life. It is not, therefore I said, it is not a strategy. It's not what you do. It's a kind of a guideline. It helps us in our daily life, our normal life. It is not meant to be instructions for the big questions in our life. You know? So when there's real evil happening, Don't just turn away. Don't just ignore it. It is our duty to help. And um, whenever we can. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Thanks. Okay. So... <clears throat> There are five methods to stabilize the mind, clear the mind. So let's assume that we are able to deal with the external world so we do not create more obstacles for ourselves. We have managed our external world in a way that we're leading a simple life. We are not getting into trouble with everybody around us. And we have more or less peaceful life so that we can do some practice, some sadhana. What are the three possible, five possible methods? One is paying attention to the breath, breath awareness, allowing it to become fine and subtle, gently allowing the time of exhalation to increase until the number of breaths taken are so few that it appears that the breath has subsided. This means breath elongation, and also breath awareness. And 
you may notice it does not start with number one asanas. Okay, it does not mention asanas here. It's talking about breath awareness. So there is an element of meditation. Breath awareness is belisam pranayam, elongating the breath. Pranayam leads to meditation because the breath and mind are very closely connected. So that is one of the first methods. Remember, this is not merely a technique to make your breath fine and subtle. Because the moment you start trying to make your breath fine and subtle, you will start observing the mind. You will notice that there are some jerks in your breath or you notice there are pauses in your breath. When you notice that, you will observe, if you're sharp enough, you will catch some thoughts which are disturbing you, which are troubling you. So you become very self-aware. Become aware of your mind. So this is a beginning to meditation. Second method is by contemplating on the senses and their subtle internal counterparts and understanding how the internal world is constructed. What does this mean? We all know the senses, we feel hungry, we eat, but then we find it tasty because the taste, the sense of taste enjoys the taste so much that we continue to eat even though we are not hungry. So this is when the senses are taking over. So all our senses are not well trained. They are pulling us outward. Once again, the same idea is this external, outward moving mind. And that is manas. These are the senses. And so when we study the senses, we try to understand how they are constructed. We try to understand how this relates to our mind and our desires. And by understanding the senses, by observing them, we are able to also train them. So this is the second method. Third method is contemplating on inner light of pure consciousness and coming in touch with the inner voice of conscious, conscience, buddhi. So this is slightly deeper meditation and coming in touch with buddhi. And this is, of course, a wonderful thing if you can do that. When you come in touch with buddhi, buddhi guides you. Fourth is contemplating and meditating upon great saints and sages. I mentioned this earlier, that this is a very good way of also dealing with the senses. Because this soothes the mind, calms down the mind, convinces the senses. So this is another method. Or we may contemplate upon any other object that is suitable for the purpose of yoga. This fifth method is sometimes misunderstood because actually the sutra says we may contemplate or meditate upon any other object. It is the commentary which explains that it is an object that is suitable for yoga. Not just any object, but an object that is suitable. If somebody asks me, why can't I just, instead of taking a mantra, just keep saying Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Can I use Coca-Cola as a mantra? Now I asked, now, is this a suitable sound? Do you really want to fill your mind with the words Coca-Cola? It's like a song, you know, which you hear a very catchy tune. It keeps on repeating in the mind. That's what happens when you have a mantra. You repeat the mantra often enough and then it is in your mind all the time. Do you want to have the words, this song, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola in your mind? What image will come? You will obviously see the image of a Coca-Cola can or a bottle. 
what does that image bring with it? The whole Coca-Cola culture. Is that what you want to contemplate on? If so, then do so. But that is not suitable for the purpose of yoga. So for the purpose of yoga, you need an object that is auspicious. That is good and auspicious. Okay. Any questions about these five methods? Okay, in that case, I think we can end our session here. We will continue next Friday, same time. And thank you for being there. Have a nice weekend, everybody. Bye-bye.